Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Aishwarya Raman, Director and Head of Research, Ola Mobility Institute. Welcome to the session on transition to clean air transport system. Uh, with me are the panelists of the day, Dr. Anoop Bandiwadekar, Environment Program Officer, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, uh, Promit Mukherjee, Associate Fellow, Center for Economy and Growth, Observer Research Foundation, uh, and we are soon expected to be joined by Akshima Ghate, Principal Rocky Mountain Institute, India. Uh, in today's session uh, titled Transition to Clean Air Transport System, we are going to talk about zero emission mobility revolution in the country. The zero emission mobility revolution in India is an inflection point in the country's decarbonization journey. Our climate goal of cutting emissions to net zero by 2070 announced at COP26 necessitates a complete and urgent overhaul of the energy guzzling internal combustion engine sector, among others. The ICE sector emits 337 metric tons of carbon dioxide a year, much of which is from trucks, followed by two and three wheelers and cars. These are the transport modes whose electric and other low carbon variants are gaining currency today. This transition to a zero emission mobility future though is not without its challenges. This panel therefore will unlock some of the key channel challenges, unpack some of the key challenges for everybody's benefit, as well as point to solutions that could accelerate India's journey towards a 100% clean air mobility system. We'll begin our discussion with opening remarks by our panelists. We'll start with you, Anoop. According to you, why should India focus on clean air transport? Thank you, Aishwarya. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. Um, as we all know uh, from our urban systems, transportation is actually one of the largest source of urban air pollution. Um, most in most major cities, industrial or power plant sources have either sh been shifted out of the city or completely relocated uh, pretty far away uh, from major city sources. Uh, so as far as cities are concerned, uh, it's construction uh, and transportation along with several other smaller sources that are key source of air pollution. But more broadly speaking, as you outlined, Aishwarya, the Prime Minister has now outlined a goal of cutting uh, our climate emissions down to zero by 2017. And uh, transportation and its dependence on petroleum products is really going to be a key hurdle in getting to that goal. Uh, by 2070 or actually well before that uh, goal in 2070. Uh, and so that's really the reason why we ought to be focusing on transportation sector sources. Um, the good part of this story is that quite a lot has been done in India over the last 20 years to tackle the problem of vehicular air pollution. Uh, we've done significant work in terms of getting our new vehicle tailpipe emission standards up to uh, the Euro 6 levels. So the Bharat 6 emission standards are more or less equivalent, not exactly, but uh, more or less equivalent to the Euro 6 emission standards that are in place in Europe today. Uh, are uh, non-road vehicle sources, the construction equipment and agricultural tractors, they have come to stage four emission standards and soon by 2024, we'll go to stage five emission standards that will require a diesel particulate filter on all of these vehicles. Uh, now, all of this is enabled because in 2020 April, uh, we made a transition to clean ultra low sulfur fuels of so diesel and gasoline, with 10 parts per million sulfur fuel. Uh, what we have not done so well uh, are uh, our tackling of evaporative emission standards, um, whether they are from uh, the petrol pumps themselves or whether they are uh, emissions that happen during the fueling of our motorcycles and petrol cars, etc. Uh, we've not 
done relatively well on uh, tackling in-use emission controls uh, from of our motor vehicles. Um, onboard diagnostic systems can be used better for inspection and maintenance programs. Uh, newer technologies, right, remote sensing can be deployed uh, to tackle uh, and identify uh, heavy polluters in the fleet and you know, getting them to fix themselves. We've launched a scrappage policy, but it actually lacks sufficient teeth uh, in order to have a major impact in getting older vehicles off the road. Uh, we have not tried uh, to any large extent uh, retrofits of diesel vehicles, uh, getting some of these PS4 vehicles at least fitted with a diesel particulate filter retrofit uh, to get their PM emissions down. Uh, and then certainly we haven't done enough, although several good pieces of work are going on on managing overall demand, you know, whether that means restricting the number of older or more polluting vehicles or whether you know, charging fees to uh, more polluting vehicles. And we have some kernels of that, like the environmental compensation charge in Delhi. Um, those kinds of experiments need to be expanded. Uh, we also have kernels of uh, what would be known as low emission zones um, or zero emission zones uh, in India. And again, that experiment from small scale needs to expand. But as you alluded, you know, the only way we are really going to get to our net zero emission goal uh, before 2070 is by moving towards uh, zero emission vehicles. Uh, whether they are going to be electric um, battery electric vehicles or in some uh, cases, uh, hydrogen powered fuel cell electric vehicles. Um, but by and large, uh, it would be either of those technologies that will get us there. And so most of our attention going forward um, ought to be on how promotion of these zero emission vehicles in Indian fleet while thinking about retirement of older diesel and petrol vehicles. So, so let me stop there and you know we can take more during uh, follow-up conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, Anup. In fact, in fact, that's a great segue to the question I had for Promit. Uh, Promit is our journey towards a zero emission mobility future all about battery electric vehicles. Is there more? Should India do more? What are your thoughts? Thank you. Uh, firstly, greetings to everyone. It's great to be part of this panel. Uh, to your question, I think maybe I'll uh, kind of bring the focus to air pollution specifically a bit, uh, because I mean, between climate mitigation and air pollution, there are a lot of synergies, but essentially air pollution is a problem of right now, uh, you know, between uh, one or two million people every year are dying from air pollution. So any solution right now has a big benefit. And if you were to look at electric uh, mobility right now, and kind of look at, uh, I mean, electric mobility is the predominant technology now, but if you look at it as from a more segment wise potential and kind of look at which are the segments which are actually contributing to air pollution as such, uh, if you look at, say, the carbon monoxide emissions or if you look at the NMVOCs, it's, it's the petrol dependent, the scooters, the two wheelers that are the main uh, kind of contributors to that. And there, I think electric mobility already has a lot of traction. There's a good business case for it. Uh, we're already seeing not only from a demand side, but also from a supply side, a lot of interest, a lot of manufacturers coming in. Uh, so there, I mean, for that segment, even for the three-wheeler segment, uh, to for commercial vehicles, even passenger cars in the next few years, it's pretty clear that, you know, electric mobility will be the, will be the foremost technology. Uh, but when we come to, say, the other kind of emissions, if, say if we look at the NOx emissions uh, or the hydrocarbon emissions, right? Uh, there, the diesel power, the trucking sector, for example, is, is the major contributor to those. And in that segment, it's not really clear uh, which would be the most cost-effective technology. I mean, electric mobility does exist, uh, but the question is how much investment will be needed uh, to kind of push, push uh, electric vehicles in that segment. Uh, so there, I think there we need a better roadmap. And I think there the fuel cell technology is something that is, uh, is being discussed. And, uh, but again, it's, I mean, we're not really clear how far away that is uh, because uh, I mean, there are a lot of hurdles to achieving that as well. So the question is, which one is more cost-effective? Is it more cost-effective to enable electric mobility in that sector? 
uh, the trucking as well as the kind of long distance busing bus is another sector where uh, electric mobility is not evidently the best solution because essentially because uh, i mean the battery pack size has a lot of weight penalties associated with it now that can be compensated if you have very extensive charging networks if you have say e highways or uh, if your every you know if your highways have enough fast charging infrastructure but that comes with a very big cost uh, so is that the most effective way or is it better to kind of look at fuel cells in that in that segment so it's not clear yet but what i would like to point out if you're talking from air pollution right now uh one of the big gains is you know bs6 is a is a big transition for us you know especially in terms of the nox emissions which are you know they've cut it down to almost half of what it was earlier so just even if we just look at short term the gains from phasing out older vehicles say a stronger scrappage policy or uh, you know a green tax on older vehicles which was also being spoken about these things can have immediate benefit in terms of reducing air pollution and essentially what you're doing is you're saving life so it does it you have to focus on these as well and in the long run zero emission technology will be the case in some segments it's clear in other segments i think there is a need to kind of have a better collaboration between industry the policy makers to try and understand which is the most cost effective pathway we can enable any of these technologies but where, which is the most cost effective one where is the investment going to come from how do we uh, create a taxonomy as such which is what is being spoken about in terms of financing as well to kind of understand how investment can be channeled into these segments so that's one aspect but again just i like to point out one more thing that you know even even if you move beyond technology and look at uh, what is the reason why pollution has increased in india it's essentially because motorized transport has shot up you know it's gone up tenfold in the last two decades so the challenge and the challenge now is you know our motorization rates are still much lower than western countries and in many ways that is an advantage for us because we are not obsessed with the private car craze the ic based private car craze that exists in the developing countries so there is a great opportunity here to push uh, clean affordable safe public transport uh, create better create safer streets create uh, infrastructure for non motorized transport i think that is where a big gain can happen and that can be our unique pathway you know uh, zero emissions everyone's looking at and it will happen but we need to kind of take advantage of what india india's uh, mobility patterns are and that really requires a change in the way investment is focused uh, in terms of you know like we are kind of obsessed with building roads and flyovers if you look at the budget allocation it's all towards highways if you look at city budgets they're all focused on building roads and highways so there's a need to change that mentality and there's a lot of research which shows that when you actually put money into public transport the economic benefits are also really great uh, so i think that uh, that bit needs to be pushed and also of course that transport can also be clean because we're seeing electric buses for example are really you know they're really catching the attention of policy makers so uh, i think that these are the uh, i mean this strategy also needs to be looked at uh, in, in addition to just zero emission vehicles so yeah i'll stop there uh, absolutely promit i think you rightly highlight how india is so well poised to ride this wave of shared connected electric and most importantly active mobility as well given that uh, we uh, as a country have less than 23 28 two wheelers per thousand population 120 or so 128 if i'm not mistaken um uh, two wheelers per thousand population and 23 cars per thousand population unlike a lot of the advanced economies where this figure stands at 800 or 900 plus a thousand population um so you're right i think we are highly dependent on walking and cycling uh, to go to our workplace we're highly dependent on buses but in this day and age where there are also aspirations associated with individuals pertaining to their upward socio economic mobility how realistic or idealistic are we in promoting active mobility what should some of our key strategies um, be around that you know what should some of the measures at the city level look like to incentivize the wider uptake of uh, walking and cycling uh, you did speak about uh, promote some of the infrastructural aspects but i'd love to hear from both of you on what do you think some of these key enablers could look like to make active mobility more common uh, anup to you and then back to promote sure uh in fact one of the key parts i think pramod is absolutely right that we need uh, more investments in our public transport systems particularly buses and uh, if you go back and look at our national urban uh, mobility plans uh, not since the jnn urm scheme ended 
now almost seven, eight years ago, uh, have we invested a significant amount in uh, purchase and upgrade of bus systems across India. Uh, and uh, renewal of that kind of an effort, a JNN URM uh, type of a scheme where uh, essentially centralized purchase of uh, buses happens is going to be absolutely essential. Uh, needs from across the city show that we need at least uh, an order of 150,000, if not, you know, uh, 250,000 buses to be uh, procured uh, just in the public uh, sector alone. And when we consider the fact that actually 90% of the buses that are currently operating uh, on the road are in private sector hand, um, you know, we can actually see how big a scale of intervention that is possible in this particular sector. So I think uh, quite a few opportunities in terms of moving that forward. But one additional point I'll make is there are strategies that thread this needle about uh, meeting the aspirations of people in uh, having private sources of transportation, um, encouraging uh, more shared as well as public uh, mobility options, uh, and encouraging what, as you nicely described, active mobility options, walking, bicycling, etc. Schemes that have worked well in other parts of the world um, have started often in the form of what are known as low emission zones or LEZs. Uh, the LEZs essentially say, okay, you know, certain polluting vehicles are restricted from coming into a city center or so on. And London is a great example. It started doing that. Uh, a combination of a congestion charge uh, on vehicle that discourages uh, essentially private vehicles from coming into the city center, coupling that with sort of a environmental compensation charge so that, you know, let's say BS1, 2, 3 vehicles have to pay extra charge. And with today's RFID tags uh, that essentially every vehicle now has got in India, uh, such sort of uh, uh, charges are quite possible. But over time, then that can get tightened into an ultra low emission zone and even a zero emission zone. So that where we have private transportation, we, we've got um, electric uh, mobility essentially. But at the same time, the zone is designed, keeping in mind that the number of vehicles within the zones would be quite few. Um, and the final thing I would say is, and this is something we should learn uh, from Beijing and other Chinese cities, what they've done very consciously over the last uh, 10, 12 years is A, put in place a cap on total number of vehicles that will be registered in the city. B, over time, bring down that cap. C, over time, encourage greater share of electric or zero emission vehicles as part of that cap. So essentially, Beijing went from having 300,000 new vehicles being registered you know, 12 years ago uh, to now only allowing uh, less than 80,000 units being registered. And over time now, uh, out of that 80,000, about 60,000 are allowed to be registered as uh, electric only vehicles. Um, so essentially they went not just uh, in, you know, 75% market share of electric drive, but they actually reduced uh, the number of new vehicles that get on the road in half. Again, a strategy that we could deploy uh, in some of our uh, cities. Uh, thanks so much, Anup. Uh, Pramit, any concluding thoughts on how we can make active mobility more common? Uh, what sort of behavioral change strategies do you think cities should adopt here? Yeah, I think in terms of behavioral change strategies, uh, Anup already pointed out uh, quite a few of them. Uh, I'd just like to maybe speak uh, from more of how we plan our cities and in terms of how our policies work. Uh, so if you look at our policies, there is they do talk about a lot of focus on this. You know, national urban transport policies. Key message is move people, not vehicles. And you know, we have uh, we have uh, 
lot of like for example the metro right the metro system expansion has been a very successful uh, thing we have a very strong metro policy which talks about a bunch of things you should be doing while creating metros you know like alternative analysis uh, looking at the kind of feeder systems looking at uh, transport oriented development uh, but the issue here is that these policies all kind of work in silos uh, if you look at you have a metro policy which talks about tod then you have a tod policy which talks about something else uh, metro policy talks about land value capture then there's a separate land value capture policy so uh, essentially when a state is trying to plan for these things they have too many documents but not enough actual guidance so i think there that's a big problem because if you do create an integrated system uh, where it's easy for me to access public transport uh, even if i do have a car i might still prefer to take a metro if if it's easily accessible to me you know if i if there's a proper feeder system to it uh it's also cheaper for me to take the metro you know while i still might own a personal vehicle my trips might actually be from public transport uh, and so i think that but the missing piece of this is that the planning is not done in an integrated manner each of these things happen in silos and i think if if we can create a more comprehensive uh planning system where all of these policies come together where the different ministries uh, come together i think that could be that could be a big change and could make a big difference to active mobility uh thank you pramit so yes i think concerted efforts coordinated efforts are the need of the hour uh you also raise an interesting point on you know how making both of you in fact highlighted how making certain provisions available uh, such as you know infrastructure a low emission zone within the city uh, a, a a zero emission mode of transport readily available to the masses will also drive adoption that then raises the larger question on finance this transition to zero emission mobility is not cheap so what according to the two, two of you are uh, some of the more sustainable financing solutions india should consider urgently Uh, and in this whole journey what do you think could be the role of multilateral organizations or development funds and agencies to aid india uh, in its transition to a zero emission future uh, we'll start with you anup sure uh, let me just say two sort of um, specific interventions and then we can zoom out uh, more broadly uh, for example one such uh, intervention that the reserve bank of india could do is to bring uh, electric vehicles under the priority lending sector uh, regime uh, that will essentially um, give a very strong signal to the banking sector uh, to encourage sort of flow of finance to uh, the retail side of the customers it's really you know the two wheeler three wheeler market actually more the three wheeler but you know parts of two wheeler but also certain types of commercial four wheeler uh, purchasers that are struggling with um, uh, access to good finance and as we move towards uh, truck electrification component uh and i can come back and you know uh, tie up that discussion about hydrogen at a later uh, time uh having access to this kind of finance facility is going to be very very important so, so that's a very near term immediate policy action that the reserve bank would take the second one as you mentioned about multilateral institutions um or you know in other finance facilities like the green climate fund etc um that is going to be access to concessional finance, concessional loans uh, i mean in, i think we don't really need grants or you know uh, on this particular front but getting those concessional uh, finance facilities available for two types of um, customers one is really our transit bus operators and so on where part of the problem is that um manufacturers of zero emission vehicles are not so keen to do business with some of the transit agencies because they they are afraid that some of the payments uh, that are tied up uh, in these schemes aren't really going to be delivered over time and that's where having a backstop uh in in these types of finance facilities where they can release the money up front and then you know it gets slowly repaid back so that the it's not the vehicle manufacturers that are taking the risk it's really the institutions uh but the second uh a part of this is going to be about uh truck fleets uh that will want to electrify 
Uh, and again, uh, the the whole point in this case is going to be that there will be several fleets that would benefit tremendously from electrifying. They would save uh, in terms of their total cost of ownership over the life of the vehicle. But the upfront purchase cost of these zero emission vehicle trucks will be significantly higher than their diesel counterpart uh, for at least next 10, if not longer years. Uh, and if we want to accelerate sort of that transition, then having this type of finance facility will be extremely important. Um, let me sort of leave it at that, but you know, we can go back to bigger issues uh, from there. Uh, thank you, Anu. Pramit, over to you. I think those are some of the points I would have also brought up. Maybe I'll uh, bring up one more additional point is in terms of uh, something that has been a big policy focus but hasn't really picked up and which is looking at involving the private sector in terms of how we talk about PPP models. Uh, if we see policy-wise, everyone's talking about PPP. You look at the metro policy, PPP is one of the biggest things there in the bus sector. We are also talking about it. But if you look at how transport is regulated in India, all the power is in the hand of the government authorities right? in every case. And then there is no mediator there. So that's why there's a big risk for the private sector to enter into this uh, market. And again, as was mentioned earlier also, 90% of the buses in India, for example, are in the private sector. So how do you bring these buses into a more formalized system? I think that is where a big gain could be made. Uh, but essentially, that will require a more... Uh, either you need a regulator somewhere there, which which can, but again, that's a big political move, might not happen. But even the way you structure your contracts to just give enough power to the private players in that, right? Uh, to take their decisions, to have longer planning horizons for them. Uh, I think that that if that can be uh, instigated, you know, that can be pushed up, that would make a big difference to metros uh, for one, but also the bus sector, which is where uh, really the investments are at this point, not there. Uh, and the second point is in terms of what it's difficult to channel investment into the STUs because essentially their problem is that a lot of their expenses just come from their operating expenditure. So it's not it's not just if you give them money at one point to buy a bunch of buses, it will fix their financial structure. You need a you need a financing system which can keep giving them money as, as on an as needed basis, right? So that they can uh, kind of value their contracts, they can come through on their commitments and that will push more people, more push the private sector, push more manufacturers to enter into this space. I think maybe these two issues uh, I would like to highlight broadly and we can discuss further. Thank you so much for those. I think both of you are highlighting two essential aspects. One is um, how do we de-risk the zero emission mobility space, be it investments in electric mobility projects, be it investments in strengthening, augmenting our bus networks, not just modernizing the fleet or expanding the fleet, but making buses more useful, more aspirational uh, for the uh, end user at the end of the day. Um, and you're also talking about, you know, policy consistency to a large extent, because policy consistency and coherence that can also prime the zero emission mobility transport systems for investments, not just from the public sector, but also prime them for investments from the private sector. Uh, one point that drew my particular interest is what Anup mentioned about uh, the financing needs of not just fleet operators, who could be obviously both private and public sectors uh, in the electric mobility space or shared mobility space, but also individuals, you know, individual truck owners or auto rickshaw and taxi owners, etc. And how do we finance their needs? And this is where uh, the uh, private sector lending uh, comes into play uh, and also raises a larger question around, you know, equity uh, in this transition. Uh, so how equitable is our transition to a zero, emit uh, zero emission future? Um, what are we doing? Are we doing enough to ensure that this transition is just? Uh, both of you, please, uh, your thoughts. Well, if you actually think about, you know, the government of India's approach uh, to in giving incentives to electric mobility, uh, I mean, this has sort of played a very large role in the initial set of thinking that uh, the FAME program um, that uh, gives fiscal incentives has uh, chosen to focus really on two-wheelers and three-wheelers and taxi segments and buses 
uh, essentially for this reason, uh, to, to say that, okay, you know, which kinds of vehicles do we want to encourage uh, at the time? I mean, three wheelers uh, and buses kind of serving the needs of, you know, a, a vast cross sections of the society. Uh, but again, you know, uh, two wheelers as the entry level aspirational vehicle uh, that again serves the needs of uh, um, a lot of middle income uh, families. Uh, and so you see that now, uh, one of the things that we are going to come uh, across fairly soon, if we are not already hitting that, is achieving this broader transition is going to require, you know, bringing other sectors into the uh, uh, ambit of this FAME program. And that will include cars as well as trucks. Uh, but I think when we think about, you know, the concept of equity in this, we should probably put a bigger frame uh, around it as well. Uh, by that, I mean, thinking about uh, what externalities of uh, the current mobility system that, uh, are, that we are trying to address. Uh, who's suffering from air pollution from these vehicles? Uh, those who are forced to spend their time actually you know, by the roadside, by where the dense traffic goes and so on and so forth. Those who don't have the luxury to have uh, you know, filter installed at their homes uh, or maybe not even have uh, a, a great uh, shelter to live in. And once you start thinking in those terms, the urgency of uh, getting you know off of these fossil fuel driven vehicles across the board, uh, I think should become more uh, transparent to everybody. And so, let's try to think not just in terms of customers of vehicles, but really who's suffering from these modes. And then one final element, which is you know coming up again and again in global conversations as we engage in them has been uh, the access to uh, critical materials and minerals that are going to be required during this transition phase. Um, where those um, new mines are going to be located, uh, what does that mean for the indigenous people uh, who are in that area? Uh, are we going to deal fairly uh, with those communities as we will want to tap new types of resources uh, in making this transition. So I think we should sort of uh, put even that bigger frame uh, as we think about this transition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anu. Pramit, so what are your thoughts on, you know, job losses as well? Uh, and, and, you know, Anu places a point on the minerals, the raw materials we'd need for uh, the future of mobility in India. And in that, is that transition going to remain equitable uh, in the coming decades? Your thoughts, please. Yeah, I think I speak a little more about the job losses bit as well, uh, in terms of if we transition to, for example, now the electric mobility transition, how does it affect not just the OEMs, but actually the component industry, which is where a lot of the employment is today. And if we uh, kind of try to see what the transition is going to be, the basically you need a higher skill set to kind of engage in the components you need for electric mobility. Now, the tier one manufacturers, uh, the bigger ones might be able to make that transition, but the skill sets that will become redundant are the kind of more lower level skill sets, say the welding, the engine testing, that kind of those kind of things. And these are really the segments where uh, their ability to upskill is also, uh, it's very restricted. Uh, and, and there needs to be a focus on that. And some stuff is being done. The, the skill development uh, you know, ministry has some programs for uh, upskilling these, these uh, segments. But I think those need to be scaled up. And I think there is a need for a roadmap to how how these, uh, you know, how these job losses can be compensated for. Because it's not as simple as saying, you know, if the EV industry will create the same number of jobs, but what is the actual skill set required for the present, uh, uh, you know, the people employed in this ICE-based industry to shift to those jobs. And I think that will become an issue going forward. Maybe not immediately because the IC industry is not going to just go away in the next 10 years or so. But... In, in the long term, that is going to become a big problem. And speaking to the second point about uh, global 
equity, right? Like, oh, how are we going to access these critical minerals? And I think the key here is now in terms of how much focus we put on R&D in India, right? How, how much do we, because even though we speak about electric vehicles as one category, it's actually many categories. You can have many battery chemistries. It is a constantly evolving field. Um, and, you know, that people talk about battery chemistry improvement in terms of just, you know, energy density is getting better. So the prices of vehicles will come down. But I think the other important thing is, uh, can you shift the critical mineral requirement towards minerals that are not coming from these, uh, you know, places where you're not really sure what the governance structure is, you know, who, who are actually, who's actually mining these minerals, what are the uh, consequences for indigenous people. And we're seeing some uh, pushback on that as well. Like Chile is thinking of amending their constitution to kind of make it harder for people to access uh, minerals in areas where there are indigenous populations, uh, you know, where now they're facing water crises and things like that. So, uh, I think this this is where we need to bring in a more of an R and D focus to our say the PLI schemes we have now or the manufacturing incentive schemes where uh, how do we uh, kind of focus on technologies which are where the critical mineral dependence is is more equitable or even in terms of just accessible because right now the mineral dependence is such that we don't really have any control over those supply chains so that that's going to increase volatility in terms of EV prices in terms of how much you can scale up manufacturing. We saw that with the semiconductor crisis right now as well. So I think the R and D focus needs to be picked up, and you know it's it's not it's not just about developing those technologies indigenous indigenously. We can go out and you know what what the other countries have been doing, where you go out and buy buy smaller companies who already have developed that tech. Uh, Reliance is doing that now, where they're going and buying. Uh, they bought a company which is working on sodium-based battery batteries. So uh, these kind of these the, our model of knowledge transfer can also change in terms of how are we acquiring tech as well. And I think these, these, how this plays out will have a very big uh, impact on how equitable the transition actually is as well. Thank you so, so much, I, Pramit. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I, yeah. Actually, Pramit brings up a very important point, uh, which I think should uh, be an overarching theme for India going forward, which is really this focus on innovation and skilling of our workforce. Uh, and the more we start thinking in those terms, uh, the more we'll also realize that the key is in accelerating this transition towards zero emission um, sources of power, zero emission transportation, and so on, not less. And that goes back to the question about jobs and so on that, that was being raised. India is actually in an, um, a very enviable position uh, if you are in Germany or if you are in United States, where vehicle population is very large, essentially sales aren't growing very much or declining modestly. Uh, when you are transitioning to zero emissions vehicles, you are actually doing a swap. Um, so there is you know, a, a winner and a loser there. India uh, is a place where vehicle sales will continue to grow for the next three decades. Uh, if we keep now building new ICE-based production facilities and plants, if we keep training people in ITI facilities to take care of those vehicles and so on, then we are only perpetuating that cycle and actually make that transition eventually more difficult. The faster we get to the part where we basically get commitments from our uh, automotive OEMs to not make any new investments in ICE facilities. Uh, any new investments will only go towards zero emission facilities. The easier that transition becomes over time, because as Pramit again said, right, it's not like the ICE vehicles are going to go away. There's going to be a demand for those. So all of that existing workforce that has been trained, has been employed in that sector can actually continue to serve out essentially their lifetime working in that particular sector. What's really critical is not to force our coming generation uh, to be wedded to these fossil fuel technologies, uh, which we know will become obsolete and will create a problem uh, of uh, not having adequate skills. And, and, and so the lesson from all of that really ought to be that we need to move faster towards zero emission mobility, not slower. Uh, going faster somehow will actually make it easier 
uh, particularly with you know uh, uh, the Pramit's uh, point that focus on innovation and development look really long term. I think again we have the basic skill sets in India. Uh, the kind of educational system that will be needed uh, to make those kind of um, transition possible. But we really need to move quickly. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, recently, the Ola Mobility Institute also concluded a study on skilling uh, India's workforce for an EV-ready future. So we did look at, you know, the kind of job losses that might exist, but also the kind of jobs and roles that would get carried forward to the EV ecosystem and how we can prime our young workforce, uh, 500 um, a million strong, half a billion strong young workforce that India is blessed with. Um, the uh, We have only five minutes left for this conversation and let me move to uh, the discussion on uh, charging infrastructure, right? I think that's something that we haven't had time to discuss so far. Uh, this is also tying into the global competitiveness uh, point that both of you raised just earlier. So we all know that a key enabler for widespread and rapid adoption of EVs is the presence of robust network of charging points. India currently seems to be prioritizing point charging and battery swapping equally. South Korea, on the other hand, has a homegrown breakthrough technology of wireless charging where buses and cars are charged while driving. So concluding remarks from both of you on innovation and the charging front, what should India truly prioritize? Should we develop our own solution? Uh, and how can we be globally competitive uh, and become a trailblazer in the e-mobility ecosystem? Promit first to you and concluding remarks by Anupya. Right. Uh, so I think in terms of uh, the charging, again, it's a really, a, it is a financing issue, but it's also really a coordination issue. Uh, who is going to implement the charging infrastructure? There are like, there's so many aspects to it. Uh, so again, you need a kind of central body, which is not only doing the planning, but also the implementation of that as well. Uh, and we need a clear strategy about what, what charging infrastructure is needed for what segment. I mean, you know, because it is very different from, for different segments, uh, for private cars, for example, even if you want to enable home charging, uh, the discoms need to be responsive to provide, you know, be quick enough to provide the connections required to people's homes and, you know, which is also a big, uh, which is also not happening, which is why home charging is again a problem there as well. So uh, we need to have a clear roadmap for that. And I think there is a focus in, if we look at say the, uh, the Green Climate Fund and you know these the GCF and you know they do have a focus on charging infrastructure. This, this is something that uh, they are willing to invest in. It's not, uh, it's not one of those segments which which people aren't talking about. I think the problem is how do you channel that and create an effective. Uh, charging uh, system in India. I think in that the planning has to be better, essentially. We need to have a clear roadmap for that, which uh, right now I don't think we do have such a clear roadmap. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. Anup, closing thoughts on uh, global competitiveness and India being a trailblazer. One area where India can um, choose to lead is actually by developing uh, early and fast implementation of what I would call megawatt scale charger. So actually not think small, think big. Think about where most of the pollution is coming from. That's diesel trucks. Uh, recharging electric trucks is going to require charging at scales, uh, not at you know, small kilowatt hours, uh, but really you know, hundreds of kilowatt hours or a megawatt sort of scale chargers. Uh, not a place where uh, global standards have yet emerged, so we don't have to necessarily follow a particular direction. So um, if I had to place a big, bold bet for India to go and lead in a sector, I would say India should go ahead and think hard on truck electrification and go for a high-powered charging network. Um, you know, Thank you. If, if Thank you want to be leaders. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anup. On that note, uh, all of us take leave. It was an absolute treat to moderate today's session. Uh, Anup and Promit, your expert responses today underscore the importance of adopting a 360-degree approach to the transition to a clean and green future. Uh, the work you and your organizations do is instrumental in advancing India's collective understanding of and journey towards clean air transport and mobility systems. Thank you.